first talk of the last day, which is probably the most difficult situation. Because many people are leaving, and also because, as, uh, as I have said, you have to make a bit apart the world that you know. So the Riemannian compact world that you have heard during two weeks. For this morning, you just put this on site. We will recover it in a few hours, but for the moment, this uh, for it. Because uh, all these talks will be done in a Laurentian context, which is uh, not really much known and not really much developed, in fact, in uh, non commutative geometry for the moment. But I will try to show you that we can do things in a Laurentian context, even if we don't have a fully set background like in the Riemannian case. So I will start first showing the, you the difference between Riemannian and Laurentian. So this is, of course, what you know by Earth. Uh, very well, uh, usual spectral triple. So what will be the, the difference? The first difference we are going to consider is non-compactness. It's not a property of Laurentian, of course. Uh, so we can start with a Riemannian. But we need to use non-compactness in Laurentian setting. Why? Because if you take a Laurentian compact manifold, there are some terms saying that you always have some closed time-like curve on it. So basically you can go back uh, in the past, something like this. And on a physical point of view, it's not so many realistic. You can do such space, but it's quite restrictive. You want something yeah, more uh, with some causality on it and usual thing coming from Laurentian geometry. And there are not so much difference dealing with the compact Riemannian manifold, except that when you make computation, it's sometimes far more <laughs> complicated. Uh, but basically, the user algebra will be non-unital. So function decrease in infinity, vanishing at infinity. And especially in this tool, it's not mandatory, but most of the time we will work with a second algebra, which is a unitization of the first one, mainly for technical computation. And we will try that the first algebra is an ideal of the second one. And there's a slight modification about this compact resolvent condition, just make it same by every function in the algebra. So something should be compact. So typical. Uh, not, not necessarily. Uh, ideal is to have some nice property in, in, in the first one. But this is not saying completely set. It was mainly done on Moyam. Yes, some unitization. It can be the stone cache. No, it's between one point and a stone, stone, stone check compactification. In fact, with our theory of causality, there will be some time only one suitable compactification called Nash bit compactification, but some, something between. So the two algebra, in the first one, we have smooth function vanishing at infinity. The second one is usually some bounded function, but we need some uh, some restriction because we want that this commutator remains bounded. So basically, having some boundary as a derivative. And one example of Rn, if you take a Schwarz function for the first algebra and bounded function with a bounded derivative with for the second. So this is still in Riemannian. Now, how to go from Riemannian signature to Lanchian signature? And basically, there are two problems that are related. First problem is the Dirac operator, which is not self adjoint and elliptic as in the Riemannian case. Second problem is or Hilbert space, because we will still use the space of section of the spinner bundle, but if there, it was quite natural to define an Hilbert space in the Riemannian case, it's a bit more problematic in Laurentian case and pseudo Riemannian in general, because we have several possibilities. The first possibility, using the natural Billinian form coming from this uh, Laurentian spin structure, give you a uh, in our product, which is not positive definite. So you don't have a Hilbert space, but a shine space. A space with non positive definite in our product and some symmetric properties. Uh, can you define a Hilbert space? Yes, you can. You just change this in our product by some positive definite Brian form. You have, in fact, several possibilities to do it. Then you have a possible Hilbert space. So basically, we can always start with two different in our product on our space of section, and there exists a relation between them. Relation is done by an operator, a J operator, for the fundamental symmetry. This uh, operator with G square, emission, and we can turn one product 
to the others and also to the reverse. So be careful, this has nothing to do a priori with a relative structure. It's just called J because from the initial formulation of Frank Press or Bognar, it was a, the notation U, so I've, I've kept this notation. But uh, in order to distinguish with the round J and relative structure or white J, uh, but well, we can also change to this, but it's quite nice to keep this notation because of the usual property that we know what we are using. Yes, it would be gamma zero, <laughs> typically. <laughs> typically, no ancient case. But it can be pseudo-Riemannian, it will be the okay. product of more. Uh, it will be gamma zero in <laughs> practical <laughs> examples. Gamma zero then, but it's yes. So basically, such not necessarily all symmetry, because there are usually many for one frank space, but most of them can be related to some uh, space-like reflection, so some transformation of the metric which turn into be uh, Riemannian, in fact. And we can consider it like a kind of weak rotation performed at an algebraic level, but I put better than a weak rotation, but n not necessarily better in definition, but in the way we will use it. Because usually when you use weak rotation to make computation law, it can mean that you turn your problem into a Riemannian one, you make the computation, and then you try to go back to Lorentz and after all. It, the idea will be a bit different. It mostly we take the tool from the Riemannian geometry, and we try to bring the tool in a Lorentzian world using this fundamental symmetry. So basically, we will do everything with Lorentzian signature, not turning to Euclidean to make computation. But we will need this symmetry to define uh, some, some things. And there is a nice theorem coming from Elga Baum, uh, first written in, in German and brought to the uh, community of non-commutative geometry by Alexander Stromayer, which says that uh, if we use this crime space structure, we recover the self advantageness of the Dirac operator. There is one condition uh, related to the condition of completeness in the Riemannian case. Here we don't have a uh, nice completeness condition for pseudo Riemannian manifolds. You have geodesic completeness, but that's a fully, fully completeness condition. The condition which is used in the proof is that we ask that our space is complete when we turn the metric in a Riemannian one using this uh, space like reflection associated to, to the fundamental symmetry. So basically, for the moment, we cannot really use uh, space with Good singularities and things like that, but maybe for the future, it is, this is not. I don't don't know if it is uh, necessarily condition, but at least it is something. Uh, so basically, we can now define some pseudo Riemannian spectral triple using same kind of data, but we not we we will recognize that the Dirac operator is adjoint is defined using this fundamental symmetry. So it means that the Dirac operator is adjoint, but in the Klein space, and this is written in the Hilbert space, because you can always choose to start with the Klein space or with the Hilbert space, because we can go from one to the other by the fundamental symmetry. What's P? P is signature PQ. So basically, you have, yeah, Laurentian is minus one, then you have plus one for, for the, depending on even or odd, the number of or my minus signature you have. And you need also, yeah, this compact resolvent condition need to be updated because you don't have an elliptic operator and you use uh, some elliptic modification. So I won't talk so much about pseudo Riemannian because basically it was uh, done by uh, Adam and Cohn and we will have a complete next door on pseudo and you have indefinite and more general things like this just after mine. My uh, uh, consideration is more about can we do something practical with this? in a launch and setting, and we cover some information, extra information that was not existent in the Riemannian case. And it will be, of course, causality, which is something particular for launch. But for this, we will need to restrict to launch and signature, because I cannot really talk about causality in so the Riemannian setting. And this is still a kind of problem of how to extract only manifold with launch and signature. Here. We can construct always a fundamental symmetry from a launch and manifold, and it can be done by using some time-like vector field, 
and taking triple multiplication by it. So basically, gamma zero matrix, uh, gamma zero ma 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 matrix. So our first idea was to express always the symmetry as kind of one form in our quantum vision. Sorry? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, oriented, time oriented, of course. But uh, I will work on in your hyperbolic after. So we will have all, the, all those conditions uh, to, uh, together. And uh, what it was done by Mario Pars uh, and uh, uh, I know uh, different people working on this. But this is not completely satisfactory because you don't ever prove that uh, of the inverse result. Saying if we set a spectral triple with this kind of condition, do we have only a Lorentzian symmetry or more? And it's not, uh, well, you know, this is sufficient and probably not. You can have uh, more than Lorentzian phase using this. So there's still a open problem to have potential future in so many years reconstruction theorem for Lorentzian Oxidor with the Riemannian saying exactly what we have. But since we want to work, we will uh, further restrict or kind of manifold and using globally hyperbolic first this time, which is still very useful for physical application. Why do space time are nice? Because they are from you know, the, the result uh, known as a setting theorem, come from Gerosh initially into physical uh, setting and after a smooth version by Bernard Sanchez, saying that such space time can always, uh, if, uh, if this metric expressed like splitting like here, uh, uh, with a Riemannian metric, set of Riemannian metric, and an independent time term using global time function and coefficient with a square of Laplace. And from this kind of decomposition, you can say that, okay, if you have a globally hyperbolic manifold with this completeness condition, but quite easy to, to check because it just changes sign here and so it's complete, then we can always express uh, this fundamental symmetry as just a commutator between the Dirac and your global time function and just with this conformal factor in front. Because this basically corresponds to this gamma zero matrix if we consider a basis where you take uh, your global time function as the first coordinate. So that's a particular case of one form, just a simple commutator and conformal factor. And from this, we can have a kind of inverse result. If we imagine the sphere of spectral triple, that we know that it corresponds to some Riemannian spin manifold, but we don't know the signature exactly. If we require that the fundamental symmetry there exists, at least for, for fundamental symmetry of this form, then the metric must be Lorentzian, and furthermore, in fact, can meet a, a, a global splitting. So that's why this is quite nice, because we have a kind of restriction to Lorentzian manifold. So to make kind of summary, but of course, it's assuming some reconstruction theorem at a higher level. It's not a reconstruction theorem. We just assume we have a spectral triple corresponding to some third or manifold in front of the usual way. This tells you that we are uh, uh, in the Lorentzian case, obligatory. Of course, we don't have all Lorentzian manifold with this, but we have at least every globally hyperbolic. So we are somewhere between. <laughs> we have a guarantee to have a Lorentzian signature and to have inner space to work with. So the idea will be, I have to this talk of our work, to take this condition as some working axiom until we have a uh, better background for large aspect are triple and maybe uh, less restrictive axioms to, to involve more manifolds. So those are the axioms that I will use today, but probably in one or two years it will be <laughs> different. We work so with ILVA space, first non-unital algebra, then some unitization for computation. The operator with this compact condition and boundary condition, and we create this fundamental symmetry, recovering the adjoint of the operator, and we create that this symmetry can be expressed in those, this triple one form. So this is the basic background in which we will work. Now the question is, can we extract some information from those data? So the, the goal is to only use those data for spectral triple and just try to find every information we can get, especially about usual causality. So causality, you must know what geometrical concept basically come from the division of tangent vector in several categories, space-like or causal. 
and we have that two points on manifold are causally related, if there exists a curve which is causal from Q to Q, so whose constant causal uh, vector is causal everywhere. This is a complete geometrical concept and a bit like cone distance formula, we we'll try to make some algebraization of this concept in order to using with this algebraic triple. The idea of this algebraization is to use a set of functions which are called causal functions. They are well-valued functions which are non-decreasing along every future geometric causal score. So basically, when you have two causal relative points, one in the future of the other, the value of those functions in the future points should always be greater or equal to the value of the first one. So we have a particular example of those causal functions are time functions. We are expecting phase inverse only particular case. And this includes also all the constant functions as well. Then the question is, this is only an implication, but for some space, not all possible space, but for some, you can have the reverse condition, saying that if we take all the causal functions and if we compute this comparison between two points, if you have this respective for every causal function, then you are sure that your point, those points are causally related. That's an equivalent. And in particular, or globally, hyperbolic space time respect this condition. It comes from maybe from Fabien Bernard, but coming from the result from Bernard and Sanchez and the splitting theory. So the idea will be, okay, we can take this cone here, and since we have a condition of points using evaluation of functions, those points, we can do the same trick as in cone distance formula and doing some partial order between pure states. Saying that uh, two pure states are causally related in the evaluation in all the causal functions respect the same inequality. So this is the easy part. Now the most difficult part is how to define this code, because it's still geometrically defined. And I will first show you some naive idea to arrive to the result. This naive idea is the following. What's a causal function? It's a bit like a time function, but somehow degenerate. So you can be stationary at some part. And we've shown before that when you use a time, uh, global time function, you can construct this kind of fundamental symmetry, which turns this Hilbert space to French space, go back to Hilbert space. So what happens if instead of putting a time function here, you put a causal function? Now your idea is that we should recover the Hilbert space, but not with a positive definition, but something non-negative due to the fact that it's the, 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 the particular this constant function, you get always zero and things like that. So if you combine both condi conditions, you can say, okay, I go from the Hilbert space to the Klein space using this fundamental symmetry, then I go back using this commutator, and I must find this kind of condition going from the causal function. And so we're able to prove that, in fact, this condition is a necessary and sufficient condition to, uh, to extract all the causal Function. So it is uh, on globally hyperbolic manifold, but in fact it's true for more general manifold. This globally hyperbolic is ma mainly for using this condition that you will define causality. A uh, function is causal if you only if for yeah, every spin on your Hilbert space you have this perspective. So there is a complete proof. I won't show you the complete proof because it's very technical, but just very squash how you can compute this result. Basically, it's uh, taking that kind of matrix is positive semi-definite on every point on your manifold. Then you can compute the characteristic polynomial of uh, or, uh, the coefficient and you can check uh, the sign. And computed characteristic polynomial, if you have this Newton identities, you can compute using the trace of the power of the matrix. And in the trace of those power, we have a trace of combination of gamma matrix and derivative of the function. And you will find that all those conditions are equivalent to those two involving the trace of gamma matrix to give you information of the matrix, and you will get that the funct your function is time-like and growing in direction of the time. So we have that F is a causal function. So since we have the characterization, now we can define a causal structure for non-commutative space. So okay, of course, it's a partial order structure, but we call it causal because it will correspond to some usual causal structure. We just say, okay, well, uh, Lorentz and special triple, we extract all the functions from our algebra which are emission and respect this condition. 
Here we can see the, the futility of this unitization because uh, if you take the uh, initial non unitary algebra, you just have no causal function if you have a zero function because you cannot have growing function if they are going from, from zero to zero. So we need more for this computation here. Yes, uh, in some part it will not depend, after uh, it will depend. I will comment at the end of the slide on, on, on this. We need to add some condition because, you know, at Lorentz and space, we have sometimes causal space, some acausal space, and this condition can be translated in this way. We will require to have enough causal function. So the span of this set will fill the entire algebra. Uh, in fact, this condition in the commutative case corresponds exactly to the acausal condition because if you have an acausal space, you have a closed time like curve, all those causal conditions are non decreasing, meaning they are constant on the curve, and so you cannot generate the whole algebra because all those functions are constant here, yeah, and you cannot separate the state. In fact, this comes directly from the sun was just theorem. And we'll still keep this condition in non commutative context because we need this to show that we have a well-defined partial order which depends on this state. So when we have this, we can define some partial order that we have a causal relation between states, of course, on the unitization. And we can also extend to a mixed state, even if you don't have any correspondence in the commutative case, this works also for mixed state, you have well-defined partial order for this. And the result is that when the fact x is commutative, come to global equal space time, then this relation corresponds to the real causal relation on M. So here yeah, I can come on this unitization problem. In the commutative case, it's not a problem. Why? Because every state in the initial unitary algebra extends uniquely on this unitization. So you basically have a few more states, like point added to infinity, to think for a cylinder, for example, you just have one point I did in the past, one point I did in the future. Those points point are included in the partial order, but you can just ignore them to recover the, the initial manifold. This comes for the property that uh, we ask the first algebra to be an ideal of the second one and from the character property of, of the two states. We will, after, ma do many examples with almost commutative manifolds. It's the same because the unitization process only occurs in the part of the algebra which is commutative. So, all in commutative case, and all motive case, everything is independent of this cause of unitization because you can get rid of them at the end. Of course, it is still uh, a bit problematic for truly non commutative case like Moyal when we end with some causal structure on the unitization and we cannot necessarily go back to the initial. Manifold. So it's still something which needs to be explored if it is dependent or not on the issues of unitization, but it's probably possible. And somewhat, it's a bit like we cannot go exactly to the point level, go back to the point level for those kind of moyal space, more complicated. But for almost commutative manifolds, they have absolutely no problem. It's independent of the choice of unitization. Okay, so now we have a new tool that we can play with it and try to see what we can get as a result if we apply this uh, definition to some non-commutative space. And the first model we have today is just product of a manifold will be two-dimensional Miko ski at first and M2 matrix. The goal, of course, is at the end to go to a standard model, but we are not at this point for the moment. We will make a usual product between special triple. It has the exact same definition as usual. The first will be a low chance spread actually form here from two dimensional Minko sketch. And second one is the usual Riemannian spread actually form this time because we make always a product with one low and one Riemannian to get a low at the end. And we'll work with diagonal Jack operator here because the other Jack operator can be obtained by some unit transformation and it just makes some great geometrical change at the end of the computation. And here's one of our task symmetry, but for the gamma zero matrix and, and one. 
So first, can we have some causal function on it? Because at first, when I was saying, oh, there are only maybe constant causal function, we must have enough of them to generate the algebra. In fact, there is the condition here. Yeah. Not, it's not a bit of fault. So uh, function of, of course, function with matrix value. So we can think about two by two matrix with empty function on it. And it's basically the condition that we must respect it in order to have uh, causal function. But we can have a picture to respect a big kind of condition. You have a first part which involves the derivative of the diagonal element, which may be greater than some condition depending on the derivative of the off diagonal element and its value. So it means that the diagonal element will be usual when the value causal function growing along causal curve here. The off diagonal element will can be complex, but must be bounded, bounded in norm and derivative by this growing. So it can be slightly oscillating, depending on so the way you grow. But with this, you can generate, you see, the complete whole algebra without any problem. So what's the result? First, what are the space of pure state? I think that maybe we, we should know this. Uh, a pure state will uh, need two data to design it for the point on mean for skin, a complex vector. And they will define such that applying to a matrix is the evaluation of every entry of the matrix on, on the point. And with this, you know, product with a complex vector. And this, of course, is uh, it does not vary if you change of a global space to your complex vector. So you have a question of complex vector of norm 1 CP2 by a phase exchange. It means that you have the complex projective line. And since the complex projective line is set isomorphic to a sphere, we can think that the space of pure state is a product of a you know, manifold and a sphere. Of course, it's only set theoretically because you see the geometry is far different from the usual sphere. Well, the result is the following. First, there are two necessary conditions in order to have a causal relation between two pure states. First, the two points on which they are related must be causally related on Minkowski. So there are no causality violations coming from this coupling with the finite part. Second condition is a bit tricky. We can ima imagine the sphere divided in several parallels of latitude. And the condition says that you cannot move from one parallel of latitude to another. There are no possible causal relation between different parallels of latitude. And in fact, so those causation of parallel of latitude will depend on this unitary transformation to make a transform between the, the slight rotation of the sphere. And even if this result is a bit surprising, in fact, it's quite coherent with uh, the computation of uh, consistent formula okay, done by Bruno Yoshi and Fermat in the 1980s. Uh, because as a result, if you compute the condition formula M2, is that those uh, parallels of latitude are separated with an infinite Riemannian distance. So it's quite logical if you have uh, infinite distance between them, you cannot have causal relation when you go to the Lorentzian setting. So now, in order to have a complete condition, we must see how we can move. We can talk about moving more physical world, but on this internal space, can we move freely? No, there's a third condition. I know we have sufficient necessary condition. Uh, since we are moving on a parallel, we can define position by two angles. The condition is the following. We must have, and this will be sufficient, that the length of the curve between P and Q must be greater than some value, which is uh, the difference between these two angles, divided by the difference of the eigenvalue of the vehicle parameter. So basically, if you want to move your internal space, you must move enough in your continuous space in order that causal relation is possible. And we can think this relation in another way. I like to rewrite it like this, of course, when the curve is not uh, null here. Because here we have a ratio between two quantities. First, the quantities will represent some distance on this parallel of latitude, on the internal space. Second quantity, length of the curve, in fact, physically is the proper time. So the time where you put the clock from P to Q. So it's a uh, ratio between some distance and the time. It's kind of speed. Speed in the uh, internal space related to the time on Minkowski. And this speed is just a constant boundary defined by the eigenvalue of the So this can be understood like a speed of light constraint. 
give a maximum speed in your internal state that you cannot first unless you violate both of it. A diagonal with D1, D2. Diagonal operator with D1, D2. And if you want a more general, this D1, D2 are just the eigenvalues, and, but you have to turn your sphere and the file in different ways. So uh, we have, I'm trying to generalize a bit this because I said before, okay, the definition is nice of few states, but we, we can also apply to general states. And so since here we have some uh, sphere, and we know that if one go from this point to another one, we have basically this condition is like going through this circle. What happens if we try to cross the sphere directly? Can we go cross the sphere and maybe have something better? The answer is yes, we can cross, but we don't have something better. Because if we consider uh, the states, here we only consider a convex possible uh, combination of of two states at the same point, of course. We have this kind of condition. We have, uh, in fact, a geometric like interpretation. So you imagine the two states. Of course, you can only move on the same plane, same kind of restriction. But the distance you consider here is, in fact, the greatest projection on your parallel of latitude. So basically, if you cross, you will get exactly the same constraint in the same amount of time you need than if you make the turn. So it was a first turn model, and we tried another model, this universal model, the two-point space, of course, product with some manifold of the Russian setting. So the idea is to take finite part to be the usual two-point space, and here we will have some necessary non-diagonal uh, matrix, because we see the diagonal case will be trivial. We cannot make this take of unitary rotation, because in this case, the pure states will not remain the same in some extent. And here it was tested with different uh, space time. Unfortunately, uh, we cannot for the moment compute for a complete generic space time because uh, the computation are really huge. But it was done for two dimensional curve almost with space time and also check for four dimensional Minkowski. So basically, the result remains always the same if you take a curve one or four dimensional one. It's not a particular result for the two dimensional flat field. Uh, first result. What happens if you take the diagonal and you have two sheets and they are completely separated? You cannot go from one sheet to the other. Just two times copy of usual causality. Now the question, can we jump from one sheet to the other? Because uh, the M2, uh, with the M2 model, it was a sphere, so we can cross. But here it's a bit like a jump. Or let's say to another. And the answer is yes. If you take this direct operator of diagonal, so we remove the diagonal part because it's trivial. Then we have the same kind of constraint. First, we need, so we want to go from P to Q prime of the second sheet. You can imagine that Q prime is Q in the first sheet, the corresponding form. We need that P and Q are causally related. And once again, the length between both of the, the proper time must be greater than some value pi on 2 uh, divided by absolute value of M, so related to this direct operator. And once more, it's current with distance formula, because if you take the Remaining distance formula between two points, we have a, the distance infinite when the operator is diagonal, and it's 1 over m when it is not diagonal. And still, we can generalize this to make states. We have this kind of also condition. Uh, if you want to move between the two sheets and stay something behind. And then we have just done some other generalization that what happens if the distance between the two sheets is not constant? So a bit uh, outside the usual or most commutative context, we can use a scalar field to the direct operator, which will represent so this distance between the two sheets we can vary. And then we have a, a modification here because this constant m must in fact go inside this proper time. So we will not compute the usual proper time, but some weighted proper time using the value of the scalar field. But basically, we still have causal relation possible. Of course, I don't know for, for the moment what could be kind of physical interpretation of a weighted proper time due to a scalar field. Okay, this was basically from causal I'm going now for to the last part of my talk, which is can we go further? Because causal information is only part 
of the information of both the metrics because you define a metric but only up to a conformal factor. So we would like to have uh, the same kind of result as the Riemannian context, so a distance formula but for instance this time. So it's for a few works by Fasino Peda Patrin and then one uh, no work by Walter Moretti. Maybe I should also be put Adam Greeny here, I don't know because there are some hidden results maybe coming one day <laughs> about this. So uh, I will try to show you that using this approach of causality, we can have a go near to a distance formula, not complete proof distance, but not so far. So what's a large and distance? It's dual in fact to remain distance. It's the supremum and not the minimum of the length of the curve. We only extract extract a future a dielectric causal curve, and the main thing that this uh, distance is zero one well another point I'm not sure that it is not the support is on the wall for manifold. And there are several other properties like for example the one great trigon inequality. And it's even not continuous in the general case, but fortunately we will work in globally hyperbolic case and this case is continuous not in continuous and even it's also almost every differentiable. So I will recall the construction of condistance formula because this it's um, like a mimetic form this construction. We can divide this construction in three steps. The first step, you try to get rid of the path. Having some path independent formulation, we say on the form of inequality. This comes basically from the second fundamental theorem. Uh, so we have a condition that the usual distance is greater than some supremum under a condition on the gradient of your function. The second step is to prove the equality between those two. And the remaining case is easy. You just take the usual distance function. Because there are some twisting because you need to find this. You use Lipschitz condition instead of P1, but it's basically easy. And the third step is to have an algebraic formulation, operator formulation, using you know, this condition, the Dirac operator. And then you have the well-known formula. Those three steps can quite independently be generalized, in fact. The first step, you get a kind of similar constraint, of course, it's dual, it will be less than some infinite, and using a condition also on the gradient. That's not the most difficult. Second step is far more problematic. You cannot say, oh, I took the usual Lorentz and distance formula here because this fun function is only uh, non zero inside your future light cone, it's not global. And also, it's not uh, if it's continuous. So you have to go to more general function, almost every differential more with some uh, also causal function. Fortunately, this results remains true when you go to causal function because of this mononeutonic behavior. Where the, the second fundamental theorem is not valid with an equality, but still with inequality. And so I proved several years ago that we can always have an equality between this, but we can we have to go to, yeah, for the actual and true, current proof, we have to go to, to a larger set. I don't have the proof for the moment using only Lipschitz continuous function or small. Then can we have an operator formulation of this? But when the surprise we have compute the causality that in fact we find a constraint very similar to the causality, which is exactly equivalent to those one. Uh, it's here for even dimensional because you're the Kalish operator, but you properly can do this for odd, but using, you know, this far easier to go from even to odd dimension to the reverse in spin geometry to have to double representation, thing like that. So I did the following. Uh, you ask the function to be causal by adding, plus adding some extra dimension when you require that its speed is one. So basically you will require some condition like this using it. So, yes, we have generated all three steps. What's the problem? The problem is this is valid for P1 smooth function. You can extend to Lipschitz continuous, but not outside because you cannot use this kind of definition to define the gradient in this problem, like this counter function. And you cannot uh, control the behavior of your function just by using uh, the gradient. 
So basically, the equality case is not necessarily proof for the case, uh, for the function that we are using for the standardization for the moment. So that's why I would like to, to prove for the moment is equality case using only two standardization formulas. You can still have this proposal for the some distance formula. You can check that this formula is true for space when you can approximate the distance by smooth function, like what are some Minkowski is exactly the, the usual uh, distance formula. And you have all the property of Lorentz and for formalize this uh, inverse triangle and inequality uh, system uh, support. And what are some yeah, remaining difficulties or additional difficulties for complete this proof using a smooth function only, but the problem is uh, we don't have a lot of present in Lorentz and geometry, especially concerning this behavior of distance function, where it is smooth or not. And also, an additional difficulty is here we use not bounded function, but we have to go further outside this Fisker algebra case. We don't need to extend the user setting of bounded function to something unbounded, to compare to us here. Uh, and there are several ways to do it. We cannot use a strict usual uh, setting of such algebra. But I hope that such kind of formula, or maybe a similar formulation, will be the true answer in a few months or years. So that's all of my talk. I want to thank you for your attention. Yes, but the way I was solving this problem is using some kind of filtration of the algebra using the time function to have a weight and adding something. Yes, and it was quite weight, but when this function is commutative, so it's quite easy to solve this problem when the time is commutative. But when the time is not commutative, we still have this kind of problem that we can extend, but we don't know if the pure state uniquely extends to the new one and so it will be dependent on the way you extend your algebra. And again, this is a problem with dependence. Yes, that is true. Yeah. The, the initial idea from Walter Moretti was to uh, use this kind of constraint locally, so we can use a vanishing function. The problem is well, was very generalization of this local concept. It was completely awful. This is completely global, but it is easier. But we have this problem to use. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the global is is better for non-equitative geometry, but still, it is additional difficulty. It's not unsolvable, but it's. Uh, Uh, but yeah, the first problem is that you cannot, for the moment, think about spectral action. You don't have a low and chance spectral action. We're thinking about it. We want <laughs> there are, uh, some meeting of the low and chance team here in this uh, institute and saying we well, well, must try to do something. But we are not into the, the standard model for the moment. And of course, it's not so much easy to to have a physical interpretation of this kind of because we don't what is moving for a pure state. To, to another. There was some uh, interpretation by, by me, I hope I know her, it's here, it's Alice here, saying that since it would be, uh, yeah, the idea was if you want to change your something, uh, going to some particles, you basically 
uh, you, you cannot move as uh, the, the fast as possible since you have this constraint coming for the distribution. It may be related to the fact that uh, the particle has some mass uh, in some way, but there's still some kind of speculation <laughs> uh, about this money. No, but uh, you, you are formulation to three million. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sincerely, we it's still some big question which physical interpretation to what school is this. If the goal was why we have translation of causality in the commutative case, what can we have in the non commutative case with this? We still don't know exactly how to to relate it to usual physical things. We have some ideas but still not make sense. Yes, yes, of course. Yes. Yes. An experiment, but uh, you can experiment the two sheets. No, but you can see this kind of uh, lower bound. But I don't know what is two sheets space time. Is <laughs> well, uh, uh, basically the. Yes. Uh, not necessarily, no. Uh, it's just because I see say, okay, it's possible to go from one sheet to another by going from the mixed state between. It's, no, it's not forbidden. Uh, but uh, it's still a tool model. The goal is to go to the standard model, of course. But in the computation, even for this two sheet, it's quite huge. We cannot, for the moment, give you the complete result for M3 and, and things like this. And yes. We did not know if it would be similar or not. We hope to have something non-trivial because everything is trivial is not really interesting, but I don't know for the moment. Thank you. 